I'm going to show you a bunch of counterexamples in calculus. And a counterexample disproves what your intuition might suggest is a very reasonable theorem, but it turns out by the counterexample is not true. The first claim that you might think is true but isn't is that discontinuities of a function are isolated. And the reason why you might think this is true is because so many examples that we see in calculus have isolated discontinuities. Like this function, x squared minus 1 over x minus 1, it has an isolated discontinuity. There's a problem spot at the value of x equal to 1. And this results in this hole in the graph of the function. Away from this problem spot, you can factor it, you can cancel the x minus 1s, but at the value of x equal to 1, you can't x equal to 1 is not in the domain. But while you might see many isolated examples in calculus, there are examples that are discontinuous everywhere. And consider, for example, this function. This is the Dirichlet function. It's very weird. It's the value of 1 when your x is a rational number, and it's the value of 0 when x is an irrational number. So, like, I can't even really graph it, but I can pretend with a few points. Like, for rational numbers, like, well, 1, 2, and 3 are integers, but also for numbers like 1 half or 13 fourths, anything that can be written as an integer divided by an integer is a rational number, and for all of those, the value of the function is 1. But irrational numbers, some of our favorites are root 2 and e and pi, for all of those, the value is 0. Irrational numbers can't be written as an integer divided by an integer. They have an infinite non-repeating decimal expansion. So this function is kind of like a comb, right? Like it goes up and down, up and down between 1 and 0 all over the place. And so the result is that this function is continuous nowhere. It is discontinuous, that is, over the entire real line. The basic notion of continuity is that I can zoom in enough on the domain such that everything on the domain is as close as I wish it to be to the limiting value. So if I zoom in around, say, the value pi, an irrational number, I look at some little interval, maybe it's a big interval like this one, maybe it's even a smaller interval, no matter how much I zoom in there, there's always going to be a rational number that spikes to the value of 1 and gets far away from the value of 0. The basic reason for this is between every two irrational numbers, there's always a rational number. And also between any two rational numbers, there's always an irrational. So it doesn't matter how small you draw your literal intervals. It will always have both a rational and an irrational in it. So it's not continuous at irrationals like pi, even if I shift it over to 3 again, a rational number. It's again not continuous because there's always an irrational number in this interval. This is continuous nowhere. Kind of fun, if you modify this function, instead of being a height 1 for the rationals, you instead make it a height x for the rationals. So that is, you sort of get the rationals going along this diagonal line while all of the irrationals are still along the axis. This actually is continuous at one spot. It's continuous precisely at 0. And basically, no matter how close to the output of 0 I would like to get, I can just zoom in on the inputs until all of the heights are within that. So in this example, 0 is the only spot where this function is continuous. For my next counterexample, I want to suggest a claim that hopefully most calculus students know is not true, but maybe take some investigation as to why it's not true. The claim is that if a function is differentiable, then its derivative is continuous. But consider now this function. This is the function x squared sine 1 over x when x is not 0. There's a problem spot inside the sine of x is equal to 0, but then it imposed that at x equal to 0 this function is 0. Let's take a look at the graph of this function. The plot of x squared sine 1 over x is this oscillating green curve here. The idea is that sine oscillates between minus 1 and 1, and so x squared sine 1 over x oscillates between a function x squared on the top and the function minus x squared. And then because of the sine 1 over x, as x gets really close to 0, this becomes sine of increasing large values, and so it oscillates up and down faster and faster. This software that I'm using here, by the way, is Maple Learn. My thank you to Maple Learn for sponsoring today's video. I'll leave down in the description a link to this entire Maple Learn document, so if you want to check out all of the counterexamples, you can check them out there. And one of the things I can do with this function is I can differentiate it, at least I can differentiate it away from 0. If I click on the x squared sine 1 over x, I can differentiate with respect to x, and I get this function. 
And the graph of this function, well, it also has an oscillatory behavior, but you'll notice that this time as I zoom in, it never goes down to zero. The, the culprit here is this cosine of one over x turn that's always going between minus one and one. And so you get this oscillating behavior up and down faster and faster, but unlike when there's an x squared up front, it doesn't go to zero. Now your first guess might be, well I've taken the derivative away from zero, it looks like it's going up and down between minus one and one, maybe it's not differentiable at zero, but it turns out that it is. If I want to compute the derivative precisely at zero, then I have to use the definition of the derivatives. So the definition of the derivative is, as many of you might recall, the limit as h goes to zero of f of zero plus h minus f of zero divided by h. This complicated formula, I really just think about it as a limit of the rise over the runs as secant lines approach a tangent line. And I can evaluate this pretty straightforward. If I plug f of zero in, my function is just zero. If I plug f of h in, well, I'm just going to plug h into this expression. So it's h squared sine 1 over h minus 0 and then all divided by h. I have an h squared on the top and an h on the bottom, so I can cancel off one of the h's. And then this limit I know, the limit is h sine 1 over h, is a famous example that we can use the squeeze theorem for. Graphically, h sine 1 over h looks like this green curve, it's oscillating up and down, but because sine is bounded between minus 1 and 1, h sine 1 over h is bounded between the curve minus h and h. And since both of those are going to zero, the squeeze theorem tells me that my h sine 1 over h is going to zero as well. Regardless, by the squeeze theorem, this limit is just zero. So the derivative of this function, it exists at the value of zero. So the end result is that we have a function that is differentiable at the value of zero, but its derivative is not continuous. And when I come here and plot its derivative away from the value of x equal to zero, it's bouncing around as fast as you can wish between minus one and one. So the fact that the derivative at zero exists doesn't let it be continuous. To set up my next counterexample, consider the notion of an increasing function on an interval a to b. Basically the notion is that if I choose two points in this interval like x1 and x2, and I look at what happens to the heights of the functions at those points, we notice that the f of x2 is bigger than the f of x1. And in general, my definition of an increasing function on an interval a, b is that if any time x1 is less than x2, then f of x1 is less than f of x2. So as I drill into my calculus students, an increasing function is a global property. It's something that happens over an entire interval, not something that happens at a particular point. However, we have this wonderful theorem that connects derivatives to increasing. And basically the idea is a derivative is the slope of this function at a particular point. And if the slopes are all positive throughout the interval, then it's going to be increasing. That's the statement of our theorem. And what I really like about this theorem is that it's sort of like a local to global property. Derivative is something that happens locally in the neighborhood of a particular point. Increasing is the thing that happens globally on a big interval. And basically what the theorem says, and, and this is a true theorem, it's not one I'm going to provide a counterexample for, what the theorem says is that if you have a local property everywhere, then you get the global property. So everything aligns very nicely. What if you had the local property only at one point? You might conjecture that there's a theorem that says something like this. Suppose that the derivative is positive at some particular point. Then your function is increasing at least on some little interval around the point. There's some neighborhood, some nearby region where it actually is increasing. This is a very reasonable guess, but it turns out to be false. There's a counterexample. And the counterexample is actually quite related to what we had just seen before. Remember our old friend x squared sine 1 over x? I'm just going to add x plus 2 to it. So other than that, it's the same function, but I've added this linear term. The plot of this x divided by 2 plus x squared sine 1 over x looks very similar to the x squared sine 1 over x we saw before, but the addition of this x plus 2 gives this sort of approximation towards a straight line near 0. As I zoom in here, it oscillates up and down with a smaller and smaller amplitude. And so it starts to look a little bit just like the function well, x divided by 2, which is an increasing function. But the oscillations, they never go away entirely until you get all the way to zero. 
Indeed, you can imagine focusing on these troughs that are regularly appearing all the way down, and it starts to get hard to see as you zoom in. But as you can imagine, there's always smaller and smaller minimums. But what has happened with the graph is that for every portion where it goes up, it starts going back down again. As it goes up, it starts going back down again. And those portions where it's going back down, where it's not increasing, are always going to be true all the way down to zero. So to be a counterexample, I have to show two things. First, I have to show that the derivative is indeed positive at the value of zero, but that it is not increasing on any neighborhood of zero. So derivative first. Away from zero, I can just use my normal old derivative laws to compute it out, but at zero, I can do the analogous calculation with the limit as h goes to zero I did in the previous example. I'll leave it as an exercise to you to prove that it's the value of one half. So this does have a positive derivative at the value of zero, but it's not increasing on any interval around zero. And the basic problem is this. Well, the derivative is positive at zero, I can make a sequence of points getting closer and closer and closer to zero, all of which have negative derivative. Specifically, look at this sequence of points. These are all the points 1 divided by 2 pi times an integer. Okay, if I plug it into the sine term, this all becomes sine of 2 pi k's, all of those are zero. But if I plug it into the cosine term, this is going to give me like cosine of 2 pi, cosine of 2 times 2 pi, cosine of 3 times 2 pi, and so forth. And so the derivative is all negative 1 half at those points, the half that you have out the front minus the 1 from the cosine term. And since 1 over 2 pi k gets closer and closer and closer and closer to 0, no matter how far you zoom in around 0, there's always something of the form 1 over 2 pi k inside of there. It means that no matter how much you zoom in here, there's always this box where the derivative is going down now, and so the function is not going to be increasing on any open interval around zero. So we've already seen how the derivative doesn't always share the nice properties of the original function. If the original function is continuous, doesn't mean the derivative is continuous. I want to show another example in that theme. You might think, okay, if you have a derivative and the asymptotic behavior of the function as x goes to infinity is nice, that maybe the same is true of the derivative. But once again, the derivative can be messier than the function. This is the function sine of x squared divided by x. Its graph looks like this. And the values of the graph as x gets large tend to flatten out to zero. Indeed, if I come and compute the value of the limit as I go to infinity, it is indeed just zero. I can prove this by noting that sine is bound between minus one and one, so when you divide it by x, it goes to zero. But check out the derivative of this function. The sine terms divided by x squared, it gets dragged down to zero, but this cosine of x squared appears that does not have an x in the denominator to drag it to zero. And indeed, if I come up and look at the graph here, I notice that for the blue plot, the derivative, it starts just going oscillating back and forth between the values of minus 1 and 1. This is not going to 0. Indeed, if I evaluate the limit of this as x goes to 0, we find that it is unable to evaluate it. The limit does not exist. So even if the function has an existing limit as x goes to infinity, the derivative may not. We've seen already that even when you have a differentiable function, it doesn't inherit the nice properties of the original function, like continuity or behavior at infinity. But the same idea is going to be true when you take a sequence of functions that are all converging to some other function. You might suppose, you might claim, that if you have a sequence of functions that all has a niceness property, like say continuity, that the limit would also have that property, would also be continuous. But this turns out to be false. I'll give you an example of such a sequence. This is the sequence x to the power of n, like x, x squared, x cubed, and x fourth. Indeed, I can take my slider, and as I increase the power of n, you can get a little bit of a sense of what these curves look like. If I specifically focus on the region between, say, 0 and 1 here, you'll notice that the curve is flattening down. So if I decrease the value of n, it rises off the axis, but as I increase the value of n, it keeps on getting closer to 0. On the flip side, if I look at what happens at the value of x equal to 1, it's always going to have a height of 1, because 1 to the million is still going to be 1. But anywhere to the left, it's going to get closer and closer and closer to 0. So 
So then what is the limit of this sequence of functions? Our sequence of functions x to the n, if I only look at the interval 0 to 1, it turns out to be discontinuous on that interval. Everywhere but 1, it's going to go all the way 0. It's going to be flattened down to 0. But at the value of 1, well, 1 to the n is always 1. And so the value of 1 itself, it remains just 1. This piecewise limiting function is discontinuous, even though x to the n's are one of the nicest and continuous functions that I can imagine. So in this video, we have seen five different counterexamples to claims that we might have conjectured are true, but turn out to be false. And there are many, many, many more counterexamples in calculus. I'm just scratching the surface. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, for the YouTube algorithm, we're mathematicians here, we all love algorithms, give the video a big like, and if you have questions, leave them down in the comments below, and we'll do some more math in the next video.